Hello, welcome to another episode of Seeing Clearly with Charlotte Giblin. You might recognise this painting if you saw the previous show. And I want to almost follow on directly from that episode, which lifted the lid on this extensive and fascinating subject of the masks that we wear and what's hiding behind those masks and why we feel like we can't express certain aspects of our personality or behave in, in certain ways. And for me, if you saw that episode, you'll understand that, the background there. But for me, it was being able to acknowledge that there was a, an angry, frightened, resentful version of myself, which was so afraid to, to speak out and, and cause any kind of conflict in case I hurt someone's feelings or changed the way they felt about me. Because it was so important for me to maintain this image for myself of well, being liked by everybody, of being nice, being constantly positive, always being there to put someone else's needs before my own. And that was great, it seemed, for a long period of time until I was manifesting all kinds of physical symptoms of stress and the clenched jaw, the, the bad digestive system, the constant headaches, the real immune system breakdown where I was uh, constantly ill. And once you become f so frequently ill, and if there isn't actually something internally wrong, then you've got to really start addressing where that problem is coming from and if there's some kind of stressful situation which is compromising your immune system as it was in my case well what are you going to do about it you can either ignore the problem as i tried to for a long period of time or start lifting the lid looking behind the masks and trying to work out where the root of the problem is and then what can i do about it and that's where i want to pick up from the last episode because it's all good and well me saying I've transformed and this is an old version of myself. But how did I start doing that? I grew up in a, in a household which was quite unusual. We didn't have a TV. We were really encouraged to read. Uh, there was talking around the dinner table. It's always old fashioned in, in some respects. And I appreciate that enormously now. I mean, it was a nightmare at the time. You just wanted to fit in when you're a kid, don't you? And be the same as everybody else. But I developed a, a fascination with human behavior and psychology. And I think that was already in me. But definitely living with my mum, her anorexia, the other mental health issues that she had, it, the two combined together to give me a very caring, non-judgmental understanding and affection for my mum, despite all of those problems that she was experiencing and, and seemed unable to, to control. And I've always been interested in, in why we behave the way we do, why we choose, why we make certain choices with our behavior, with our reactions, with our actions, why we choose to say certain things and why some people appear unable to create change or make change or unwilling. And that's a really big contentious issue. And I, I'm fascinated by, by all of it. So it's no wonder that my storytelling in my art is very closely connected to my own personal development and my emotional development and why it's so important for me to share the stories with you because I've learned how connected we all are and how similar all of our fears are. This is not new. I'm standing on the shoulders of countless psychologists, psychiatrists, self-help gurus who have written amazing books. But I found that when I was really struggling with my own personal evolution, so this was done uh, eight years ago when I was turning 40, but I was starting to, this was at the tipping point where I realized there was actually a, a significant problem. But for all of the decades prior to that, I'd been reading so many books about manifesting wealth and health and happiness. And despite the amazing gift of this inner wellspring of joy that I've spoken about in just about every video, I still had all of these problems that I'd 
created and carried with me all of this emotional baggage and all of these difficulties and I just couldn't break the cycle. How do you break the cycle? And no one book or even combination of books seemed to help. They were either too technical and scientific or they felt too airy-fairy and spiritual. And, and no matter how many times I looked in the mirror and said to myself, you're beautiful, you're, you're rich, you know, none of it actually changed the way I felt or anything concrete in reality. So essentially, that's why I wrote my book, because I needed to explain to myself, to a younger version of myself, let's say, how I found a way out the other side. And of course, it's a huge hodgepodge. It's woven together from all of the different influences I've had throughout my life, through conversations, through the books that I've read, through really, yeah, conversations, through really talking and listening to other people's experiences of how, whether they can make, make any changes, how they made significant changes, and picking and choosing and trying different, trying different methods, different remedies, if you like. And the most important aspect of all of this, if I can say one thing to myself, it's that it takes time. And that was what I found hardest. It seemed like every book I read, especially if it had been written by somebody well known, it seemed like the, the solution and the fix was instantaneous, or at least in a matter of weeks or months. I mean, we're, we're now in this sped up world where everything has to be done by tomorrow morning and as you know if you've seen any of my videos this is I'm completely against that kind of editing or video presentation I want to have a real time discussion and this is about this is real life this is my experience of how I found a way through really anxious, fearful times to a, a place where I simply don't recognise this person anymore. And it is only eight years ago. And at the point where I turned around and realised that I'd come out the other side and could then write the book was in 2020. At a point where, you'll know, uh, COVID-19 had closed everything down and there was a very different kind of anxiety which seemed to be gripping people and, and a huge amount of, of stress and, and new kinds of pressure which entered the, the world. And I found myself feeling inside for the first time, really, as an adult, that all of the problems I'd had, all of the fears, all of the anxiety, all of the stress-related illnesses that I'd had, had actually gone. And when you realise that with the backdrop of a global pandemic, it's quite a startling wake-up call to, well, actually reflecting on the journey that, I'd, that you've been on, the journey I'd been on. And I looked back and I could see that over the previous eight to 10 years, all of the decisions I'd made, the little decisions that I'd made, like gradually moving closer and closer and closer towards the sun, if you like, they'd all contributed to then being in a place of complete trust in, in myself, in the way that things were unfolding, and being able to feel absolute love. And I Ah, oh, that makes me kind of, <laughs> makes my teeth clench and my shoulder go up and my eyes squint when I say that because I don't want it to sound saccharine, but I'd stop being afraid. And when you remove fear, then trust and love was what was left behind for me. But I had to go through extensive, really challenging, fearful periods, years of my life before I could emerge into this new version of myself and it took a long time and the way that I've boiled it down and I want to just start touching on this more and more in, in my, my videos to help you understand 
the processes that I've used and how real it all became for me, how real this new version is. And it's, I boil it down to, first of all, the fact, understanding that it, it takes a long time and it's, it's really challenging. But then recognising that everybody is struggling with the same the same fears, the same issues, different flavours and textures of them, for sure. But essentially, we all want to be loved. And if we remove all of the actual needs of the biological needs of, of having food and water and a roof over our, our heads. But we, we all want to be loved. We're, we're afraid of being rejected and, and alone. And those needs, those social needs really inform the decisions that we make. And I break that down in a lot of detail in the book. But the simplicity of under the steps that I took then, the simplicity of the steps have just transformed the way I've, I can approach any occasion where there's, I can feel any sort of fear or anxiety rising up in me again and recognising it. And I think of the, the traffic lights, the simplicity of the traffic lights and starting to recognise your own internal warning system. Because we've got so used to we. I'm going to just talk about my own experience, of course. It's all I have. It's all the only area that I have any expertise in. I got so used to thinking things, to sorting things out with my head, and I managed to so effectively separate my brain from my, my heart that I almost, I was divorced from the physical symptoms that I was feeling, the stressful symptoms, and I felt I could reason my way out of anything and became numb to all of the, the physical side effects until they were shouting so loudly that I, I really had to you know, try and, and do something about it if I was going to, going to evolve into any kind of a healthy, happy version of myself. So understanding how you receive the warning signs from your nervous system, which aren't led by your ego, which aren't led by your social fears of wanting to please people or fit in or, or doing something just to be liked, but trusting the guidance that comes from, from within. Oh, getting a balance between the head and the heart. How novel, how unusual, <laughs> but it really is about balance. And I wasn't listening to the balance. So I would get extreme like twists of nervous anxiety in my stomach. That's where all of my fear stems from. You know, occasionally I would get like that sort of strangling throat, but actually it would be like an acid sort of zing in my stomach. And that would be where I would feel anxiety first. And understanding that warning bell was key to then being able to make any kind of change. So if you know how you first experience any kind of intuitive or uh, instinctive fear in your body, listen to that sign because it's there for a reason. So at the first kind of twist of, of stomach acid, I would then, I learned to think of the traffic lights to stop Right, okay, hang on. Right, what's going on? Um, this is my, my warning system. So is there, am I about to be attacked by a saber-toothed tiger? No, 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 no problems there. So what is it that's triggering this? It's going to be some fear, some pattern of fear that I've experienced over and over again throughout my, my past and learning to establish and box it off into a... Is it a, an imminent, is it actual danger? Is, is there actual danger that I'm facing at this moment? And usually not, because there's no saber-toothed tiger about to attack me. So what is it that is causing this emotional instinctive reaction within me? And then this is really, really important in this whirly gig life that we live in with all of the Instagram 
filters and everything being edited really quickly and and all the gloss and shimmer of Hollywood actually just pausing just stop and take a breath take a step back a physical step back if you need to just hang on what is happening I need to just gather a little bit more information about this situation work out how to react because this is all about learning to change the way we react to situations that we're faced with. That is how I completely changed the course of my life. I feel I need to change the picture at this stage as well. And you know me now, no fast editing, <laughs> no cuts. Let's get another version of me in here. So this was Frightened Charlotte has now emerged sort of, out of the cupboard. And I, I love the tension in this painting where I'm, I was physically incredibly uncomfortable when all the photographs of this were being done. And this is at the edge of a, of a, of a door, doorway, like hauling myself out from behind. I'm really determined and the fear has changed to an absolute determination and a get out of my way. I am going to make some changes. There is something about the shift in and this was done a year later or six months later after the the previous painting so you can see that there's been a, a change and a a sense of, of necessity of making changes as i recognize that the only thing i can have any hope of controlling in in my lifetime are my own reactions. The only thing I can possibly try and control are aspects of my life, and there's an awful lot which we can't control. But if I can start controlling the way I react to things and make some changes to, so, so when I get those alarming signs in my, in my stomach and my immune system is, is screaming out, we've been here before, are you going to repeat the same pattern, the same fearful reaction, or are you going to try something different? And that was the key. It was then delving through my, the emotional backpack of everything I've been carrying with me since I was born. All of those inherited things from my parents, all their fears that we carry with us, all of the genetic inheritance, all of our environmental, uh, circumstances that we, we absorb and every influence that we have, we carry around with us. And occasionally we get triggered to react. We get options. We're triggered. Our fears are triggered and we have an unlimited number of ways of reacting. But mostly we choose to react in fearful ways to try and defend ourselves and sort of throw rocks from our backpack at the, at the attacker. And this was a, a defense mechanism that I found was contributing enormously to my unhappiness because it meant that I simply wasn't able to change. I was caught in the same pattern of behavior, the same repetitive reactions every time. And my reactions were not to throw rocks defensively or aggressively and create a conflict. My reactions were oh my goodness, there's, there's um, a conflict happening or somebody's uh, needs, needs assistance. And, or even though I actually feel like I can't help them at the moment, I need to help them. This is the role I'm playing. And it felt like I was trapped in this cycle of constantly pumping out energy into situations where maybe it wasn't appropriate, maybe somebody didn't want me to help them, but this was what I felt I had to do. And so I was running on empty the whole time and feeling resentful and just saying yes, yes, yes to everything where I was just crying out to say no. And that was the absolute key point. In my pause moments, I tried out some different reactions. I, instead of being afraid and hiding away the reaction that I felt that I wanted to have, instead of hiding that and, and responding in a socially appropriate way or the way that I felt would make me, which would endear me most to other people or make me more popular, make me more loved, 
instead of doing that, I started tentatively saying no to things and changing my behaviour in front of other people and seeing what would happen. And as I explained in the previous video at a little bit more length, what was amazing to discover was that as I changed my reactions and stood up for myself a little bit more, made more positive decisions, well, decisions that were positive for me and had positive benefits for me, that maybe created a little bit more space in my life by saying no to opportunities, which when I was given them made me feel like, oh, sick, but I've got to say yes to that because it's what's expected of me. As soon as I started making different decisions and listening to my body a little bit more clearly, other people responded really positively and in a way that I wasn't expecting. And that started giving me a little bit more confidence. And gradually, I would listen more and more keenly to the, the first twinge of, of, a, of an acid kick in my, in my nervous system, in my stomach. If, if somebody said something to me or, or, or said, well, how would you like to do this particular job? Um, fully expecting me to say yes, because I was always the person who would say yes. And if I felt it, oh, oh, hang on, um, that's given me some pause for thought. I'm, I'm getting a reaction here. Let me just, can I just have a moment, please? You just give me a minute just to think about that. Just creating that pause, I could then address this reaction with a little bit more perspective. So well, why am I having that reaction? Is it just because I'm, I'm being asked? What about the actual opportunity? And I would ask myself, how does it feel if I say yes to this opportunity? And how does it feel if I say no? And I would just imagine the two options and the, the two scenarios and, and really feel within my body and what the reaction was. And there would always be one reaction which just felt a tiny bit better, a bit brighter. And I would know, okay, Go with the one that feels a little bit brighter. And each time I made a decision where I took, took the time to pause, gain a little bit of perspective, see the bigger picture of the situation and just ask myself, hang on, let's combine my logical thought process with what's going on inside my body and learn to trust that voice with equal weight. Every time I did that, I discovered that I felt better. And gradually, over a number of years, each time I went for the slightly brighter option, and that's why I say kind of moving a little bit closer towards the sun each time, which is not always possible. Sometimes we just make the wrong choices for whatever reason. And that's also it's really important not to regret those choices because you've made them. And if you can't undo that choice, you can't undo that reaction and that behavior, try and learn from it and, and adapt the next time you're given a similar situation to address. And consistently, as I would, I would get a much more, a much clearer indication within my body much more quickly. Like what was the right answer? How was I going to react to something? And gradually, this angry, resentful version of me started to feel far more empowered and like, actually, I can make decisions that are, that are right for me. I don't have to be afraid of upsetting people. And I mean, there were some really sort of challenging moments that I, I had to address, uh, certainly in, in, relation, in relation to my partnership. There was one very uh, key moment where I slammed my hand on the kitchen counter, which is completely out of character for me, always the happy people pleaser, slammed my hand on the kitchen counter. No, that doesn't work for me anymore. You know, having the courage to, and it terrified me, standing up for myself and, and saying that in a, in a situation where I felt threatened and actually upholding my own 
well, the, the real version of me that was that had felt hidden and suppressed for so long. And I was the only person who was suppressing that version of myself. I had created the box and the restrictions that I put myself in. And the irony being for my entire life, I've always been confident at voicing my, my fears, that I've always wanted to discuss what's going on in my internal world with, with other people. I recognise how important that is. And I, nobody would have thought that there were so many different layers of anxiety and fear happening beneath that confident exterior. And I think that's the point that most of us have these layers and we need to hide some of those layers because we just don't know how to deal with them until they, they just eat away, at, eat away at us. And then you can get to the point where you feel, well, what's, what's the point now? And it becomes too difficult to change who we are. It feels too hard. And I know that some people, certainly my mum, just couldn't make any kind of significant changes. It was just, it was too difficult. So I have enormous sympathy and empathy for anybody who really struggles with, with making change. And in the same way, I have enormous empathy for myself because it took so long for me to realise that I actually had some serious problems with anxiety and was afraid a great deal of the time and suppressed that. And I didn't want to believe it because I thought, well, I can't be having any of these issues. I'm the one who saves everybody else. I'm the positive one who people come to for comfort. So that is a completely against my identity if I'm actually revealed as being this, this terrified woman who thinks she's so strong and independent and, and is afraid of actually saying to her partner, mm, actually, you know what, don't talk to me like that. I don't like it. it these are really difficult patterns to, to break. And I know because it took me so long to recognise that I needed to break them even before I started doing anything about it. But if I can just tell you anything, it's that it, it's possible because I'm a totally different version of myself and I no longer feel any kind of anxiety, any sort of anxiousness or fear in the way that I, that I used to. I, I've learned how to trust the different voices within my, my body. I've learned to trust their wisdom and to ask people for help and to ask their opinion and bounce ideas off other people. And from the response that I get, I can then, you know, my own time, like how does their response, how do I feel about that? And go through these, the simplicity of the yes, no questions, asking my intuitive self, asking my body, asking my gut instinct, whatever you want to call it, which, which of these scenarios feels right for me? And I'm still learning. Isn't that fantastic? I'm constantly learning and evolving in tiny ways all the time. And sometimes there are real steps back. And I think that's why this subject has been so important for me to talk about now, because it's, it's given me an opportunity to reflect the, the distance travelled over the length of time that I've been travelling this journey, but also to understand that I, I have chains of, I have chains and, and repeated patterns of behaviour which were instilled in me from a very, very young age and they keep popping back up. It's just now I know I recognise them. I can tell this is a situation where I maybe might be wanting to take a little bit too much responsibility, hang on, do I really want to do, do this? Do I, or should I really do this, which is better for myself? And giving myself now the, the permission to make decisions which really feel better for me, even if they're not actually that good 
for the people around me. That was the hardest thing as well. Having the confidence to say no or to say yes when it didn't really suit the people around me. And then you learn actually the things that suit me, the things that suit yourself the most, that make you happiest, that give you that extra freedom, that sense of energy. Of course, they benefit all of the people who are immediately around you. And that's the only circle we can have any hope of affecting, really. The people, the one-on-ones, the people immediately around us, the one-on-one relationships that we can have, which with that, those are the significant ones. And hoping that when people get to know you and they see the transformation that you've made and the positive decisions you're making for yourself and how that it's changed your health, your, your physical health, your mental health, just your energy levels, the way you look, the way you behave, then if those people immediately around you care about you in any way, they will be absolutely thrilled. And if they feel that they want to make some changes to their own behavior too, that's great. If they don't, that's on them. And maybe they don't need to. We all have very different levels of personal journey. And for me, because I'm so interested in human behavior and psychology and, and identity and understanding why I have behaved like this over the years and why I no longer behave like that, because I'm so interested in it, it, it makes you know, everything I do is around this sphere of, of interest. And it's what I feel most passionate about because I've, I've traveled a very challenging journey. And I feel that if I can, if I can do it, you know, just about anybody can, but it takes time and you've really got to want to. So yeah, it felt like I'd really needed a part two on the looking behind the mask. And I know that there are going to be a lot of additional, a lot of additional offshoots for this just huge and wonderful topic. Now, if you want to know any more about my book or the paintings, you can go to my website, charlottegiblin.com or leave a comment. And if you want any more information and I can start a conversation with you directly. And hopefully this has given you some encouragement, some food for thought and uh, something interesting to look at in the meantime. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.